broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest webinar in the series run by the Smart Villages Project and the Low Carbon Energy for Development Network, LCEDN. Today's webinar is on the topic of uh, assessing mini-grid impact and looking at the long-term sustainability of energy access initiatives. And we have a great set of uh, presenters. Uh, talking about various different aspects of the challenge. So we're very much looking forward to hear what they have to say. Before we start the webinar, though, uh, we would like to see where uh, our participants are based from around the world. So we have a couple of little polls to run, uh, which I will just run now. So the first one is, where are you based in the world? And if you would like to click one of the options, uh, just so that our presenters have an idea of, uh, of where everybody's coming from around the world, and uh, we can know whether to say good morning or good afternoon or good evening to you all. I'll just let this run for a little bit longer. Right, so it's looking as though uh, half the participants are coming uh, from Europe. A quarter are joining us from throughout Africa and everybody else is coming to us at the moment from uh, the Asian region, South Asia, Middle East, and the Asia Pacific regions at the moment, probably because it's still a little bit early in the morning. We don't have anybody joining from the Americas, but uh, maybe as the webinar continues, we'll get a few coming in from there. So thank you very much for your responses to that. The second question that we will ask you is, what is everybody's professional background? So which of these sectors do you work in? If you could... Uh, Click on the relevant option now. Give this another five seconds to run. Excellent. Thank you very much. So it looks as though we have uh, roughly... Uh, one third from uh, academia and research, um, roughly one third are coming from the private sector and uh, our entrepreneurs, about 20% are coming from the non-profit NGO sector, uh, we have more than 10% uh, more than are from the public sector, policy makers, decision makers, and um, we have 10% uh, as well who don't fit neatly into any of those categories. So a good broad cross-section of uh, people interested in issues of, uh, of the technology and energy access and uh, monitoring the performance of uh, initiatives like this. Okay, without further ado, we will continue. Just before we start with the uh, presentations, I'll tell you a little bit about how the webinar will run. So we have three presentations from our three different presenters. Uh, each presentation will be about 10 minutes long. If you have any questions during the presentations, please do enter those into the system and we will either allocate them uh, to each individual presenter or if there are particularly interesting questions that we'd like to get into in a bit more detail, uh, we will save them for the Q&A session at the end and ask them to all of the presenters. Uh, so that they can uh, both answer the questions and have a bit of discussion between themselves. And you'll find uh, lower down on your little control panels, there is a mechanism for you to enter those questions into the system and send them to us. As I say, at the end, there will then be a Q&A session. And then when the webinar finishes, there will be a little questionnaire is launched on your screens. And we'd very much appreciate it if you could uh, fill in that questionnaire so we get a little bit of feedback from you. So, without further ado, uh, we'd like to start this webinar on uh, mini-grid impact and long-term sustainability of energy access. And I'd like to invite our presenter, Ariana Totsi, who is a uh, sustainable energy consultant working uh, in the context of this presentation, particularly for Gramorgia Solutions uh, in India. And she will tell us a little bit more about uh, what they have done and the approach that they have used. So, over to you, Ariana for your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. I hope you can all see the screen now. Um, yes, we can. Yeah, we're fine. Shall I delete the process? 
Okay. Do you, do you see also the um, go to webinar? No, um, we just see your presentation. Box? We okay, just see your great, presentation. Fantastic. Okay. So thank you very much, Bernie. So um, I will be presenting briefly a framework for sustainability assessment of mini grids and showcase some results that can be run through this framework and some analytical data. So some bit of context that needs. So the number of decentralized renewable energy systems for energy access are, are rising globally and more and more will be needed to reach the 2030 electrification goal. So prediction says that about half of the new connection will come from a uh, mini grid uh, before the year 2030, and they will be particularly developed in um, sub-Saharan Africa and developing Asia. Different types of models are being tested and implemented globally, and they run from uh, entrepreneur-run initiatives or uh, government uh, schemes or different form of uh, community involvement all the way to full community ownership and participation in the uh, development of the models themselves. However, the sort of uh, outcomes of this model are mixed. Some are successful and some are less successful. And there's a lack of a comprehensive framework that enables us to evaluate the long-term impact of these systems individually. A bit of like background on the literature, there's um, the majority of the frameworks available to date either um, focus on one or two dimensions of the um, sustainability, mainly technical uh, supply characteristics on economic evaluation of the financial solutions, or they're centered on the one particular perspective, so mainly looking at the uh, impacts as defined by the uh, funder in particular and um, limited number of frameworks really engage with the communities themselves to understand what is their um, long-term uh, aim and goal that they would like to see from the uh, energy access. Um, the sort of frameworks that are a little bit more comprehensive and take into consideration different types of stakeholders come from academia. Uh, and uh, they offer a comparative and comprehensive analysis, but they are, as I said, they are comparative in nature. Therefore, they are unable to reveal the sustainability of um, mini grid system individually. So, really, the aim of So the aim of this framework is to develop a comprehensive, rigorous, and context-specific methodology that enables us to analyze mini-grid singularly. And the ultimate goal is to, that to identify models that are sustainable and the condition under which each system can be scaled successfully. So starting from the technical dimension, we have the sort of 2030 SDG goal of providing modern, reliable, affordable, and sustainable energy for all. So there's a need to shift a little bit the narrative from a binary approach to energy access to one that looks at energy usability as one made of tiers. And in this sense, uh, particularly useful is the uh, framework provided by the World Bank that looks at, looks at characteristics such as capacity, duration, reliability and quality, affordability and legality of safety. Each of these indicators is provided a score from one to five that describes an increasing level of performances. And the overall usability tier is assigned by the lowest of the scoring indicator. In this way, this framework allows us to understand which ones are the bottlenecks that will enable a higher tier of energy usability. So extending this kind of approach from the technical to other dimensions, we have defined five uh, core um, areas. And each area is defined through a set of um, measures. So starting from the technical side, we evaluate this through uh, applying the, the multi-tier framework to supply, public lighting, and consumption. On the economic dimension, we look at the model sustenance, so both in terms of the upfront capital cost of the installation, as well as to the way that the car ring operation and maintenance costs are taken care of. On the livelihood side, so the uh, opportunities that these uh, mini grids have to generate livelihood opportunity locally. On the institutional part, we look at the effectiveness of the governance institutions established locally for the management of the grid, the participation of the community in large, so across different um, sections of the community, involvement of different um, uh, parts of the communities itself, as well as women participation 
the satisfaction of the user, both in terms of the supply and the economic and tariff structure and with the institutional apparatus. On the social side, we uh, look at the two measures of household well-being, so improvements in education opportunity, uh, health condition, time availability for women, and sense of connectedness that's created both within uh, the community and with the outside world. And finally, the, the fifth uh, dimension, environmental, looks at the improvement in indoor air quality and reduction in kerosene use. So we have five um, dimensions and 12 uh, measures. Um, we collect data, so to take into account the plurality of voices and different perspectives and meanings for impact, we collect both qualitative and quantitative data across multiple stakeholders. So running at household level, questionnaires and service with community members, collecting data from system log, uh, so quantitative uh, observation from site visit and data from bas bank passbook for the uh, management of the finances. At institutional level, so discussion with members of the local committee, pe uh, people involved with the technical operation and system maintenance, as well as at higher partners level, so holding interviews with stakeholders from local NGO, solution provider and funders. Um, to sort of define uh, and measure uh, impact, we enlarge the um, scoring approach proposed by the World Bank to the other 12 measures. So each of these uh, measures is defined through um, a, um, a, a benchmark from a score from one to five that is specific to the model characteristics and describe an increasing level of performances. These are evaluated based on qualitative and quantitative data collected across stakeholders and scores are assigned through iterative Delphi method approach. So here, for example, we can see that for the measure of effectiveness of governance, this is assigned a score one to five based on the uh, indicated degree of local ownership. And this is evaluated by collecting information from the local operator, survey with households and discussion with the village committee, as well as with solution provider to understand the ability of the communities and of the overall model to uh, establish effective institutions locally. Here, for this is an example, for example, for the uh, how the uh, scores are assigned. So this is the effectiveness lo of local governance, again, particularly defined for the case of community-owned systems. So here you can see this ranges from a very low ineffective systems of a score one to five that describe the major, major external intervention needed to keep the project ongoing, local operator not able to take care of technical issues or collection of tariffs, all the way to a very effective um, local governance score five where local institutions have demonstrated ability to take care of technical and financial issues, seeking help when serious issues arise. So uh, the output of the framework, as you can see here, each side uh, is uh, defined by 12 scores, one for each measures across the five dimensions. Score reflect the system functionality for each installation under the model analyzed. So by running through scores side by side, uh, this framework highlights sort of weaknesses and strengths in areas of action, as well as when we sort of like group together the scores across site, we can see the overall assessment of the model's impact, what are the strengths and weaknesses overall. Um, some results, uh, so what, how can this sort of data be used? Um, so we can start, for example, for tabulation of technical indicators. So here we see each indicators for the technical um, dimension. Uh, and the final supply, the last column, the supply here correspond to the lowest scoring indicator. So this allows us to identify bottlenecks on the technical side. Then we can maybe think about whether a high um, technical score may correspond to, the high, to a higher level of consumption of maybe into uh, more engagement into livelihood opportunities. So we can think about whether this correlation um, is witnessed or not, and if not, what type of other uh, explanation can this model give us? Um, another way to uh, see results is to run visual plot for cross of cross tabulation. So, for example, here we plot together the effectiveness of governance and model sustenance. Each dot corresponds to a particular site in each uh, location um, coded by different colors. 
So maybe we can uh, think about a effectiveness of governance score high that this may lead to a higher economic sustain and so a system that is more able to generate revenues throughout the project. So are we seeing this correlation uh, and if not what types of conclusion or thinking can be um, can be run from this. So the step one for the analysis is to tabulate results or do visual plot to point researchers to uh, areas uh, that are worth further inquiry. Then, for example, if the sample size is big enough, then we may use uh, statistical tools to identify correlations across measures that are statistically significant. And further, we can formulate and test hypotheses for sustainability and test them using, for example, um, stepwise multiple regression. So here, for example, we can say that for community ownership model, the uh, measure of unit satisfaction is predicted by X, Y, Z measures and then run the uh, statistical analysis and see what types of results come out. So as any uh, sort of a framework, there's a few reflection of things to be careful when using this uh, in everyday life. Uh, so there's a risk of flattening relevant data under common scores, so each side 12 measures. This can be a little bit reductive, so in some ways uh, there is a, um, also opportunity to provide raw data for indicators where needed. There's also a need to adapt benchmarks and scores for each model, uh, but this is also uh, an opportunity that uh, to reflect on sustainability meaning for each model. So I provided an example for community on structures, but this could be um, defined for different types of models as well by redefining the benchmarks. Then there's the challenges of acquiring enough data, particularly at village level. So there's need to plan time and resources carefully and also the challenges of field work. So geographical challenge, language and cultural barrier. So in conclusion, um, the framework provides a comprehensive portrait of the state of each installation. The scores are model specific and re reflect desirable outcomes for sustainability. By collecting data and triangulating it across multiple stakeholders, we can sort of like map and see what impact means for different people and also how uh, to validate data by comparing information across different stakeholders. It enables progressively complex level of analysis from uh, visualization of data all the way to running statistical tools for analysis that can enable us to really identify the conditions under which each singular model can be sustained and scaled. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Ariana. That was a uh, great presentation. If we now move on to your colleague, Dr. Aparna Katri, um, who, as I understand it, is going to speak a little bit to how this model has applied to some of the projects that Gramuja has uh, implemented and some real mini grids in the field. So, uh, Aparna, uh, over to you now and to your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ariana, and um, welcome to everyone in different parts of the world. Uh, what I will do is to really talk about application of this model to uh, Gram Urcha systems um, and present our insights, particularly focusing on sustainability of community owned uh, systems and uh, what are the implications when it comes to community sustaining and scaling community owned solar mini grids in this case. Um, what I want to do is uh, some of you may know about Gramurja, but I'll give a little brief about Gramurja and then uh, talk through the, the scope and objectives of the assessment we did and some results. But really, most importantly, what do the results tell us about uh, the sustainability? So, to begin with, Gramburja implementations. Gramburja is a social enterprise that's based in India. It provides um, solar mini grid, biogas mini grid, and solar water pumping solutions, both for domestic consumption as well as uh, commercial uh, consumption. Um, they have, uh, I mean, the number of implementations change. As you can see, we, uh, when we assessed, the number of implementations were less than what you see here right now for each of those uh, areas. Um, 
And the key thing is their solutions focus on remote tribal communities and the last mile uh, communities where extending the central grid is either you know, economically challenging or technically challenging. Um, so that's kind of uh, presents a unique uh, situation for community ownership as well. Uh, a bit of their model itself, how they uh, work. There are two parts. There is an economic side of the model, and then there is an operational side of their model. From an economic perspective, the model is hybrid in the sense that all capital expenses for any implementation are sourced through uh, corporate social responsibility or donations and you know, foundation grants. Uh, and then the regular operations and maintenance of the system comes through regular tariffs where each household, whether it's for domestic or commercial consumption, uh, is metered and there are tariffs and it comes through the uh, regular billing and collection mechanisms, including the uh, battery replacement cost at the sort of end of life of the battery. So that it's hybrid in terms of uh, how the system actually works in the long run financially. From an operational perspective, they uh, engage with local uh, NGOs that have worked with those communities for a long time and have built trust uh, with the communities. So they really depend on these local NGOs for a lot of the social interaction with the communities. Uh, but many times what we found is that Gramuja actually extends beyond their core technical capabilities to, uh, you know, to leverage their own understanding of the communities themselves. Uh, but strong partnership with local NGOs uh, is key to their model. And when it comes to the communities themselves, from an operational perspective, we uh, see that um, each in each village or each installation, uh, an energy committee is formed where uh, people from the village are nominated to the committee and they govern the day-to-day -day operations, uh, including the generation of power, distribution of power, through to billing and collections and resolving any technical or financial issues that come up on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and there is a fair amount of participation of almost the entire village in this process. Um, so that's sort of how their model actually works. Uh, and each scenario can be very different. In terms of the, uh, our assessment and uh, objectives of the assessment itself, we wanted to obviously understand the impact uh, that their systems are having in the communities, uh, also the long-term sustainability of the systems, um, also identify Gramurja has their own internal targets for these implementations in terms of performance, and we want to reveal, uh, find out where the systems actually performed versus what were the targets. But most importantly, identify the strengths and bottlenecks so that scalability of these solutions can be gauged and how much are these systems replicable across, I don't know, by some counts in India alone, there are more than 20,000 such communities where access is necessary. So that was a part of the goal here. Uh, in terms of the coverage of what we did, we looked at 24 solar mini grids across three different states in India. So they gave us a good geographical mix. Um, in each of these communities, we surveyed and met with about 20% of the households. Um, and they was randomly selected to get a good sort of coverage of the village. We also held open-ended discussions with the uh, village committees and the plant operators. And like stated in the framework, we actually got, got some hard data from meter readings and bank passports and higher level discussions. So there was qualitative and quantitative data both that came into our assessment. Moving on to the results, uh, quickly what we found. Um, on the technical side, for the supply, technical supply, uh, for domestic use, we found that um, domestic and commercial use, we found fairly consistent performance across all sites um, in terms of the expected tiers and where they actually came in. Um, there was good uh, performance when it came to the quality of supply, duration of supply, Barring few days in the monsoon time, it all worked really well. Uh, safety, there were no issues. Some issues with reliability, but they were really localized to situations where uh, there were geographical technical challenges in specific geograph geographies 
at very early stages. And then they were overcome once uh, technical solutions were identified. Uh, but largely speaking, even reliability seemed uh, to meet the expectations. Affordability, surprisingly, because um, households and communities were engaged upfront in the process of uh, setting the tariffs and understanding how the tariffs really worked, uh, the affordability question did not really come up. Uh, barring some occasional delays in payments uh, that were taken care of by the local communities in most cases. Um, the key thing to know here is that the uh, performance uh, tier is really limited by the capacity of the system, which in this case is really um, because the community is engaged upfront in the design um, and capacity definition stages. A lot of it also is tied to the aspirations of the community. As far as um, these public spaces, lighting of public spaces is concerned, um, this is where we found significant variation across their implementations. Um, you know, uh, performance was not as consistent. There were issues with quality and also some issues with the distribution of the public lighting poles. Um, but interestingly enough, none of these issues seem to impact the overall user satisfaction, which you will see later on which is where we have to dig deeper and see why that might be the case. As far as technical consumption is concerned, uh, you know, we saw some variation across clusters of villages, but within clusters, consumption was fairly consistent, which actually again raised questions as to why you know, clusters differ in their consumption. And again, I'll come to that when we look at the final sort of analysis and conclusions. Um, Gramurja expected the consumption to increase over time. What we found is that the consumption kind of stayed at a particular level. It did not increase and there was stagnation. And the consumption was uh, lower than the overall capacity of the system, which also raised interesting questions as to, you know, why aren't people consuming uh, electricity once it is available, which again, I'll talk about that a little later. As far as the economic side is concerned, economic sustainability is concerned, uh, for the model sustenance in Gramburja's case, it's highly dependent on the, um, for the operations and maintenance, uh, which depends on regular collections, filling and collections. We found fairly reasonable performance with most sites showing 60 to 70% of the collections being met against expectations. Um, the sites where actually the collections were really um, meeting or exceeding expectations was uh, showed strong uh, institutional sustainability features. And the ones that were lower actually uh, were either villages that were really small in size, very few households, nine, 10 households, um, or had really some cultural complexity, social complexities. Um, as far as livelihood is concerned, we found limited engagement in uh, productive activities. Most of them were linked to uh, providing uh, livelihood and supply and revenue activities for localized for the village. They were not necessarily um, generating revenue from external um, sources of you know, connecting to markets externally. So there were limitations in terms of um, revenue generating uh, ideas in these villages. And these challenges were heightened for smaller villages, the gravity was more. As far as institutional sustainability is concerned, um, governance and community participation, you know, they actually scored pretty well, effective in most cases. And we saw high levels of inclusivity um, in the governance processes, day-to-day -day operations. Uh, surprisingly, we found a trend where the participation and effectiveness of governance increased over time which probably means that it takes a while for the communities to really understand what it means to govern locally and be responsible for energy generation and distribution. Um, the presence of local NGO was very, very crucial in terms of, as well as uh, Gramurja from a technical perspective in terms of handholding of the communities to uh, build the technical knowledge and you know, um, develop accountability uh, in the communities uh, over time, but also we found that the uh, cultural issues and social issues played a key role in terms of the effectiveness of governance. Um, we found that when women are involved, 
in uh, governance. It was highly effective. Uh, where self-help group structures existed before uh, the service came in uh, and those structures were leveraged, the effectiveness and as well as community participation is particularly high. For user satisfaction, generally speaking, very high levels of user satisfaction with the overall system, technical tariffs, governance. Um, there were complaints, uh, user satisfaction with public lighting was low, but it did not pull down the overall satisfaction with the system. And we also found that the user satisfaction increased with time, um, which also probably shows that as effectiveness of governance and participation increases over time, then um, user satisfaction increases over time. So some interesting observations were coming in in terms of community engagement and involvement and the cascading effects it has on both the model sustenance and user satisfaction. Uh, I think I want to highlight a few things that uh, really the role of Gramurja and the local NGO in clarifying roles and responsibilities of the community members and while handholding them in many places, also pushing back at the right place to get the realization that you know um, some of the responsibilities are theirs. For example, in one place, you know the collections were delayed and um, there were you know the money was not deposited in the bank, and um, so the community actually came to Gramurja and said, "You need to fix this issue for us." When Gramurja actually pushed back and said that no. This problem is yours. You really need to figure out how to find a solution for the person who is not depositing money in the bank. It's not our problem. So really, this tension between holding each other accountable was evident in such um, examples we saw. Um, and same is the case where it came to knowing that a local committee in the village is really accountable for actions really helped because uh, in one of the villages we found that you know the central grid had arrived and the fact what villages were telling us is that in this case we know where to go and who to ask for help and get our issues solved because it's our committee and we can make decisions whereas if for the central grid if a poll is down we really don't even know where to go and you know who to take help from so engagement um, inclusivity you know, the tensions really played out in some of the qualitative work uh, that we saw in the, uh, you know, data collection phases. As far as social and environmental well-being, um, we found high amounts of uh, impact on uh, the social impact, household well-being, overall education, safety. Um, we Two minutes, felt, please, Apana. Sure. Women felt more safe, um, great community connectedness. Uh, um, I'll move on to the final conclusions here. Sustainability conclusions, we found that there are preconditions uh, in terms of technical and social interaction of uh, these organizations is really uh, paramount and high quality of supply is essential, but really strong engagement from the community and effectiveness of governance is essential. But really the linkages in terms of the effectiveness of governance leading to uh, model sustenance leading to uh, greater user satisfaction and the self sort of feedback loop created from there leading to higher uh, user satisfaction. But key challenge in terms of remote communities, tribal mindset where consumption continues to remain limited and less um, you know, you, uh, engagement in productive activities uh, was a key thing. So this kind of model here summarizes our findings in terms of community participation, effectiveness of governance leading to model sustenance, leading to user satisfaction, feeding back into uh, improving the sustenance um, and causing the impacts that are needed. But at the same time, if this has to continue, then for greater economic impact and development, some kind of intervention is necessary for livelihood kinds of activities and increasing in consumption that needs to happen over time. We have a bunch of other questions for all of you who are on the call, if you have time, <laughs> in terms of other kinds of community models where we would like to understand more how this framework might work and um, what are the implications for community ownership as far as the observations we saw in this particular model and how they might be 
applied to other kinds of community ownership scenarios. So I'll leave it at this. Great. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation, Aparna. And um, <clears throat> hopefully we can uh, get into some of those questions later on when we go into the Q&A session. Uh, that's also a very good reminder to everybody to keep sending in your questions. We have a, uh, a long list that have already been sent in, but uh, we look forward to uh, yet more coming in and to be able to discuss those uh, later on today. So without further ado, if we can... Uh, move on to Jeff Felton who joins us from the African Development Bank where he's part of the team working on the SE for All Africa Hub and working on uh, all of their mini grid projects so uh, Jeff over to you and your presentation please okay thank you Bernie um, uh, good afternoon everybody uh, my name is Jeff Felton I'm working here for the African Development Bank and specifically I'm part of the team that makes up uh, uh, the Sustainable Energy for All Africa Hub. <clears throat> Specifically, my job is to manage the, the mini-grid program here at the African Development Bank. Um, we call our mini-grid program the Green Mini-Grid Market Development Program, and uh, my presentation here is going to try to focus more on the uh, monitoring and impact elements of our mini-grid work. So to get to that point, I have to give you some background about our mini grid program. Um, so uh, the market development program began in 2015 um, with an 18 month phase and then it was renewed again uh, last year for another two year phase. Um, it's part of a UK government DFID funded green mini grid Africa program that also includes country programs in Mozambique and Kenya and Tanzania, Sierra Leone, the DRC. It also includes um, uh, action learning component with the World Bank and some other uh, policy projects that, um, that are implemented also here at the African Development Bank through the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa. Um, in that first phase, some of the notable achievements of, uh, of the program our uh, country assessments or our mini grid market opportunity assessments in, in a few countries and I'm going to describe those to you in a, in a minute. Um, we've also developed uh, the Green Mini Grid Developers Help Desk that's currently providing technical assistance to, to over 60 companies in 30 countries and we also developed the Green Mini Grid Africa strategy that was subsequently um, that was subsequently uh, endorsed by the African Union Commission. The program is, is organized into five uh, business lines, um, the first being market intelligence, the second being uh, BDS, business development services, the third revolves around policy and regulations, fourth is quality assurance, which is the one we're going to focus mostly on in this presentation, and then the fifth is access to finance, which is all about uh, designing uh, financial products for mini grid developers and our aim is to be the go-to space for mini grids in Africa so um, the market intelligence business line you can see uh, on on the your right here um, map of of Mozambique um, what we do in these assessments country by country is we um, we map where the grid is and where the grid is going and then outside of that uh, uh, parameter, we identify where there are uh, mini grid opportunities based on population size, density, and uh, and uh, renewable energy resources. So so far we've done. Uh, you can see uh, this map of Mozambique. The pink obviously is the grid, where the grid's going. The dark green are the mini grid opportunities and everything else that's not a mini grid opportunity or grid is off grid. So we've done these assessments so far for Mozambique, Ethiopia, Burkina, Cameroon, the DRC. We've just finishing up now Nigeria, uh, Uganda and Madagascar. Um, this is this screenshot is um, uh, shows our green mini grid help desk. This is where uh, developers or policymakers can go and get uh, information for developers. Information from anything from 
site selection to demand assessments to financial or business plan modeling to operations and maintenance. And then uh, for policymakers, there are all kinds of uh, tools uh, for them to, to develop uh, strategies and, and regulations and laws. Um, as I said earlier, we're currently working with uh, 60 different companies in 30 countries, and we're working with about uh, 10 to 12 uh, governments on their, on their policies and regulations. Um, this slide is about the uh, Green Mini Grid Africa strategy, which is essentially a policy document that was endorsed by the African Union Commission. So all of our policy work revolves around trying to promote these five uh, essential policy uh, um, policies. Uh, so the first being a clear and simple uh, licensing and registration procedures for mini grids. Second being uh, um, that the government has to have uh, clear and dependable uh, compensation mechanisms in the case of main grid arrival in a mini grid market. Um, the third is that uh, the private sector has to have the freedom to, to set cost reflective tariffs. Uh, the fourth is that um, the country has to have some kind of integrated planning between main grid, mini grids, and off-grid space. And the fifth is about capacity development at, at every stage from the developer and his employees to local government and, and main governments. Sorry. Continuing, so now uh, just focus more on quality insurance, which is uh, the subject that, uh, that I was asked to, to talk about. Um, I can say that our quality insurance work is, is in progress, is a work in progress. We're experimenting with some, some different approaches uh, and most specifically related to our work in Nigeria and Burkina Faso. And it looks like what we would like to apply is a quality insurance or, or monitoring and evaluation framework based on three different levels of, of monitoring. Um, the first being the NREL quality assurance framework, the second being a web-based performance data platform, and the third being actual physical monitoring of, of the mini grids. So uh, starting with the first one, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory of the uh, Department of Energy in the United States developed this framework for uh, basically for, uh, for self-reporting from mini grids to their communities, to their investors, to the regulators. Um, it was uh, just completed last year and we have just begun introducing it in um, Nigeria with uh, a dozen developers. It's basically a um, uh, it's basically a, a, a M&E system where, whereby, okay, the reason for it is that uh, it simplifies uh, reporting for, for people who are not technically, uh, are not technicians in, in the field. Um, and the concept is the, the developer goes into the community and negotiates with the community that he's going to he or she is going to provide uh, uh, power for of such and such quality, so many connections, how many hours a day, um, and then based on that, the, those promises, the developer reports quarterly on those promises to the community, to the regulator, um, and to the investors, most importantly. And these are actual physical or um, uh, paper reports, or hard copy reports that, that, or in the case of community, there are actual community feedback sessions. Um, so it's just like any other uh, kind of uh, monitoring and evaluation system where you specify your project goals um, and then you develop objectives and indicators based on those goals. Um, then you build your mini grid and you uh, monitor 
the performance of those of your mini grid based on the indicators that you that you chose and then you draft reports so this is the first system that that we're we're putting into place this uh, uh, NREL QAF the second system is based on a on a internet based web based uh, data platform called Odyssey and this uh, this platform collects uh, technical data from mini grids uh, fed to the platform through smart meters and GSM networks and uh, so the the data that we can see for any any given uh, mini grid would include things like the number of connections um, the voltage consistency uh, the consumption levels for each connections or for the for the mini grid um, uh, frequency of, of blackouts uh, those kind of things and we can see this individually uh, for all all the mini grids um, the limitation of this particular system is it's very quantitative and not very qualitative this is just another screenshot from uh, from the Odyssey platform and then the third uh, way that we uh, we intend to uh, practice our, our monitoring is the old-fashioned way, having uh, actual uh, physical verifications in the villages. Um, in uh, many cases, we, we are working with uh, rural electrification agencies, and it's those agencies that would actually go out into the villages and, and observe and, and monitor the performance of, of the mini-grids. Uh, the advantage to this system as as opposed to the odyssey system is this can collect very qualitative uh, uh, kinds of information uh, related to customer satisfaction and, and economic growth okay that's it for me huh? i think i was a little faster than the others <laughs> excellent thanks a lot for that jeff um uh, we've still got good questions coming in, so please feel free to uh, to send those through. Just before we move on to the Q&A session, let me invite uh, Ed Brown, who leads the Low Carbon Energy for Development Network, who are our co-organizers of this series of webinars, uh, to say a few words as well, contributing to this, um, uh, this general issue uh, based on the policy brief that LCADN have just produced. Ed, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Bernie. Um, this has been a really interesting and exciting um, session. I'm looking forward to, to the, the Q&A. Um, I'm not intending to do anything formal here, Bernie, just simply to say that this is an issue that uh, I think featured heavily in our recent um, conference last, last week here in, in Loughborough. Um, and I suppose the only thing really was just to promote the uh, the fact that our first uh, um, LCDM briefing paper has just been published. I think there's a connection to it on the system. Is that is that right, Bernie? Yes, that's right. It's both on the uh, on the web page for the webinar, but it's also uh, present as a handout here on the webinar system for anybody that wants to access it. So I think it, it fits very well with what we've been hearing about today, particularly around how we focus on the more of the social and institutional impacts of, uh, of, of mini grids and the struggles to articulate, I guess, a, a long term sustainable way in which which mini grids can, can operate effectively. And just one of the ways that we have co contributed to this is through a PhD that was completed um, fairly recently by um, uh, by one of the researchers at, um, at Sussex um, here, here in the in the UK. Um, and I think that the, the uh, we, we asked him if he'd produce a, a paper for us because we thought it was a really exciting way of, of thinking about the, um, the the issues that hadn't really been addressed before. So basically, it was looking at uh, mini grids not just in terms of the numbers of connections and the sustainability of the supply, but also much more around the issues that our first two speakers were talking about today, around how mini grids are governed and uh, the differences, say, between community owned and uh, more private sector orientated mini grids. And I think one of the things that the paper does is suggest that sometimes we've seen too much of a kind of bold distinction between approaches that are entirely private sector orientated and those that are entirely community orientated. And actually, in effect, I think a lot of the time um, there are 
possibilities for some that take something of a hybrid model between, between the two. And one way of particularly looking at the whole issue of the local governance of mini grids comes from this paper that Lawrence Gowitzer and, uh, and our colleague John Cloak have, uh, have produced. And the title of the paper is Lessons from Collective Action for the Local Governance of Mini Grids for Pro Poor Electricity Access. So if people are interested in the themes that we've been discussing today, then that's one place in which um, there's a, a paper that, that I would think would be of interest to people. Um, so that's it then, really, Bernie. Super. Thanks for that, Ed. Uh, without further ado, then, we will move to the uh, uh, the general Q&A session. Uh, if anybody still has questions, do please continue to send them in. And I'm also conscious that we have those uh, questions on the final slide from Aparna, so we will go to those questions as well uh, from time to time, maybe, Aparna, if you, uh, if you have those uh, ready. But I'll start with the first question, which has come in from uh, one of our participants, Martin Council. Um, and this is a question really to... Um, particularly to uh, Ariana and Apana, but I think we can make it more general in that because mini grids are all very different depending on the different communities that require them, um, how confident is everybody who's presented their approach here um, that their approach is suitable as a generic framework that can be applied to all, <clears throat> to any rural off-grid community across the globe uh, that's implementing a mini grid? And maybe if we start with uh, Ariana and Apana on that one. Hmm. Uh, thanks, Bernie. So um, I think that really the sort of um, strength uh, behind the um, framework that um, Aparna and I have uh, presented as, and proposed is that um, it's not, um, it, it enables evaluations of models uh, individually. Therefore, it provides a sort of like overall frameworks in terms of the definition of um, parameters and measures but then by defining and allowing the users to really define the uh, measures and the benchmarks between measures according to what their model or what their meaning for impact is then it also offers a way to sort of like tailor each um, each assessments corresponding to uh, the individual situation. So it's not universal as such. It can provide universal outputs, but then it also allows to evaluate impact and sustainability of individual models as per their characteristics and their aim. Yeah, and to, so for example, just building on that, if in, in the model that we assessed, the economic model, as I said, had, you know, upfront capital cost covered, but really for economic sustainability in the long run it was dependent on the tariffs and collections and the tariff rates as well as the collections regularity and how that money that was accumulated was being dispersed and used for maintenance or other activities so our measures our uh, benchmarks really focused on those aspects if there was another economic model behind it the benchmarks could change can be defined for it. So for example, if a model dependent a lot more on commercial activities or mix between commercial and domestic use, I don't know what those might be in different scenarios, you can actually come up with different benchmarks, keeping the overall framework still the same, if that makes sense. Yes, that seems to make sense. And uh, <clears throat> and Jeff, uh, the frameworks that you were um, talking about and their applicability across the, uh, the scope of all the mini grids that you're considering. Um, well, um, there are certain uh, prerequis prerequisites. Um, for example, a developer has to have some kind of initial training to be able to apply the NREL uh, quality assurance framework. But we are we're trying to build a, a, a small army of trainers that can do that uh, uh, region by region. Um, the Odyssey platform uh, requires, of course, smart metering, and uh, but that's um, I would say that is uh, the case. That's what most mini grids, and I would say 90% of mini grids are already using. So that's uh, um, um, that's not uh, hard to overcome, um, and then uh, of course physical uh, physical monitoring you can do that anywhere you have uh, 
the human resources to do that. Is that okay? Sure, that sounds good. Um, okay, moving on. Um, there were a lot of uh, questions about the uh, exact function of the Village Energy Committee, um, which maybe Ariana and uh, particularly Aparna can answer. Uh, but more generally, um, how can a good m and &E framework assist the Village Energy Committee? Well, maybe assist the uh, uh, the mini grid developers in uh, in making sure that the the village energy committee is you know is being kept honest vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with the developers, but also what uh, what evidence coming out of an impact analysis can actually then support the committee in its own work, and uh, you know can any of it help them, for example, um, work with the uh, the community as a whole in a more productive way for the functioning of the mini grid. Uh, so maybe if Apana starts the answers to this. Sure. So I think what was um, interesting, we because we are looking at one particular provider and looking at many implementations um, for the provider itself, you know, the MNE actually provides a view as to like we found differences within clusters and the clear implications in terms of you know um, or clusters where, for example, self-help groups existed, some kind of organizing existed before and in others where it didn't exist, or the cultural issues that came up, or the size of the villages that came up, and uh, relationship of the size of the villages, and the governance that was happening, local committee, effectiveness of the local committees. So I think for the solution providers, these then become parameters they can take into account ahead of time in future implementations uh, for, you know, for the planning and execution, uh, but also going back and saying maybe there are some communities that need more hand-holding for a longer time, so it gives those views. But I think what is more interesting, which I, didn't think, I don't think we did it in this case so far, uh, is to really take back the information to the committees themselves, and I think that question was really interesting, is to say that um, uh, most of these communities actually learn from each other quite a bit. They, they do that. So if there was a way to go back to these communities and say that, you know, here are some best practices that are being used by other communi communities uh, or other communities and villages, and they could benefit from those. For example, we found, uh, like in one case, where, you know, the role of the plant operator and uh, collections and how that was happening. In most cases, it was fixed and assigned to one person. Uh, but in one case, it was actually rotated, and they came up with this uh, with their own rationale and reasoning, saying that you know, uh, this way everybody gets to know what is involved in this, and we are not dependent on one person doing it. So they actually framed this, and we found that you know, uh, probably also builds some backup in the community or greater awareness. So that might be a practice that can be uh, you know shared across communities. So the not enabling the knowledge sharing across different energy committees uh, might be a good thing to do. So the MNE highlighted some of these uh, details across different communities, which I think the uh, individual energy village committees can benefit from knowing, which they might be blind to because they're so deep into their own communities and maybe just immediate neighboring community, uh, communities. So those, for example, in Maharashtra are not connected to those in Jharkhand in this case in another state, but bringing some best practices from other communities uh, might be helpful. Great. Any of our other presenters uh, wish to uh, to weigh in on uh, on that topic, the Village Energy Committee and uh, the extent to which um, uh, the communities themselves can use some of this M&E data? So, like, for example, another point that I could uh, add to what um, Aparna said is the um, what we had found that was particularly uh, important was a um, an activity um, that uh, Gramuda performed, which is called the uh, exposure visit. So, by which um, people from different uh, communities, even as far as from Maharashtra to Jharkhand, so very far apart states from India. Um, these people are brought to um, so new selected communities that um, may potentially have an installation in their village, are brought to uh, villages that already have one such system to um, interact directly with those communities and ask questions that they feel appropriate. And this, is this, this is one particular case in, in which 
um, you know, communities that are so far apart actually come to know um, how is the um, local mini grid uh, managed and have the opportunity to really ask uh, questions that allows them to then go back to their communities and, and say like, or sell, either sell or discuss more broadly onto what they've seen and what the opportunities that they see there. Um, and also one other thing that um, was particularly interesting is the sort of like effect of um, time. So we've seen that, for example, the um, institutional sustainability, as Aparna was saying, was really increasing uh, in time. So that sort of means that um, there's an opportunity to um, have sort of like a loop feedback from communities that probably have been uh, successful and have been around for a longer period of time to get connected with those that are um, really at the early stages and may have some questions or just struggling with some issues to bring those two uh, parts, two separate parts of the spectrum together for a meaningful conversation. So I think that's another opportunity. And I think just one more factor to add now that we are talking about it and thoughts are coming in uh, is also on the on the livelihood side. I think one of the things we found is that um, people seem to have a mindset as to what they have now as access to electricity is really very sort of precious. And it is something they didn't have for long. And now that they have it, they really want to preserve it in many ways and be very careful in how they use it. So the I don't think communities really uh, know that there is a more capacity and more they could do with what is available. So the m and &E data can go back and tell them that, you know, there is indeed excess capacity in the system. And uh, if it is governed properly, you could use it for great, better activities. So, uh, uh, and, you know, we asked a lot of questions in the uh, qualitative part of the village committees as to uh, how do you encourage, if you encourage and how do you encourage people using more appliances or you know, engaging in more sort of consumption activities and uh, more or less consistently we had answers, um, no, we really don't do a lot of that. You know, this is something we have, we want to be very careful in how we use it. So maybe going back and saying, highlighting the gap in what is available and what is actually being consumed and how they can be more mindful. Um, and it's not something that necessarily is only about preserving what you have, but actually making good use of what you uh, have over here might be useful. Super. Thank you for those answers. Um, a question um, aimed particularly at um, uh, the, the Gram Order example, but I guess could also apply equally well to the, uh, uh, the evolving m and &E framework uh, that's being used by the African Development Bank, is do you have uh, plans to share your methodology uh, with researchers and also with other mini-grid developers so that um, uh, the, the, the impact data from different mini grids could be compared directly. So the methodology itself is already published. It's available uh, in a paper. So really anyone can use it. And both uh, Aryan and I will be happy to, speaking for Aryan as well, <laughs> that we'll be happy to really uh, be available, answer any questions as to how we actually used it um, in, in the case of Kramurja. Happy to interact on that. Um, and what was the other part of it? The, um, and share it with other developers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Super. I can. Yeah. yeah on um, in our system, the of course the all the uh, data that's uploaded into the Odyssey platform is that's a public uh, platform where people can. Uh, can go and 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 see the performance of, of those mini grids on the platform. Um, the NREL reporting, uh, of course, those are hard copy reports. Uh, I think that those would probably uh, be uh, uh, protected by some kind of uh, 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 ownership of the developer themselves and and be specific to the communities involved in and the investors and then the regulator in that country. Um, so I doubt that uh, those could be uh, easily shared without some kind of non-disclosure agreement. 
but the Odyssey platform is, is a public platform. Great, and a specific uh, question on the Odyssey platform then that's come in um, from somebody that checked online for it but couldn't find it. Is it already uh, functional and, and open access? Um, that's a good question. Um, I know that uh, for certain developers it is. Uh, is. Is the public part of it open and online? I'm not quite sure. Okay, maybe you can uh, you can answer that offline, and we'll put the information into the uh, uh, the thank you emails that we send out tomorrow. That would be uh, that would be useful. So we've also had a number of questions coming in um, surrounding uh, productive uses, really, and um, whether the sustainability framework takes into account how different products are installed in the communities and and how different products are. Uh, you know, are used. You know, some communities, I guess, will have lots of different pieces of equipment installed for productive use. Uh, others might, others might not. Does your, uh, do your frameworks take account of those those differences, and do they make a difference to the impact uh, statistics that you're collecting? Ariana, do you want to go? Can I can add? Yes. So um, we have seen mainly in terms of livelihood activities to. Um, two different kinds. So the first kind is those um, small um, household level type of engagement into productive activities and um, obviously the um, purchase of a grinder or a um, fridge that can be used to um, sell uh, sort of like cold drinks and snacks for uh, the uh, communities itself. So these are really like small um, opportunities that are mainly entrepreneur run, so of a uh, personal initiative of these uh, individual households. Another level uh, are um, sort of like more um, big type of appliances that make use particularly of um, agricultural uh, processing. Um, and here the differentiation is uh, really, so these are mainly like um, processing of uh, flour, of uh, rice, uh, the, that sort of like saved, um, so we're talking about really remote communities and therefore they saved like the uh, local villages several hours for like traveling to the neighbor village. Um, these are uh, either um, purchased uh, individually by individual sort of entrepreneur that decide to venture um, into a, a business on their own. And we have also seen cases in which uh, instead uh, these were sort of provided um, to uh, at sort of like subsidized rates, so at a rate that was lower than the market rate to um, households that were uh, sort of like willing to take this loan and to uh, operate these plants. And um, in a um, in a way, this uh, kind of the, the the framework itself like looks specifically at to whether the opportunity, the livelihood engagement comes from the um, local entrepreneur spirit, or is whether like kind of like in stem from the um, uh, overall framework of the implementation itself. Oh. What we have seen, uh, which was interesting, is that in the cases in which the um, one of these machine to process agricultural products was provided as part of the um, installation cost to one particular person in the village, then it kind of um, had an overall uh, chain effect, positive effect to inspire other within the same communities to engage into the livelihood opportunities itself. So this kind of like made us think of the importance to probably as a suggestion to integrate um, a component of livelihood into all the um, projects in order to sort of like make that fun, make that idea of uh, engagement into business activities on a larger scale. So in the framework, adding on to it, in the framework itself, we do, uh, in the data collection, we do capture this information we, uh, at a fairly granular level in terms of what kinds of equipment they're using and for what they're using, how are they benefiting from it. And we use the data to then score uh, and ultimately reflected in the livelihood score. And that's where we found that, you know, it came to our observation that all these market activities, economic activities were very localized for the village within the village. 
in rare instances, there were external market linkages. Only when there was a strong um, irrigation component, for example, then you know there was also support that was provided for external market linkages. But for general domestic use, when the mini grids were focusing on domestic use, um, then it was all sort of organic and localized in the villages. From uh, my side, um, I would say that the, the best uh, mini grid developers that we work with um, engage their communities at, at two different levels. One is at the uh, M&E level when they're reporting and they're discussing the performance of, of their mini grid. But more importantly than that is at the productive use level. The, the best mini grid developers will be working with the communities to help uh, help them identify uh, business activities and to help them maybe give them some kind of a BDS training to, to structure those activities and either uh, microfinance or bring in microfinance from a, a third party to help finance those activities. Because um, uh, productive use to a mini grid developer is, is kind of like marketing. He, uh, he needs, he or she needs to sell more electricity to make the mini grid uh, viable and any electricity that's generated and is not sold is is a is, is a loss so uh, productive use and promoting productive use is 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 a big part of the mini grid developers community engagement thanks and on the on the back of that question um we've had uh, some other questions coming in around um intervention so to what extent um do the uh the m and &E methodologies that you're using enable uh the mini grid developers uh or indeed the the village energy com uh, committee to to come in and then intervene if they see that satisfaction scores are are going down or the the usage isn't quite as they expected that it should be um and indeed would they intervene in those cases or, or are they only in the mindset of kind of watching to see how the system performs? I, I, I can go on this and then we can add Arena for our observations. Um, in terms of intervention, I think what we found is that uh, there was an overall sort of uh, view that was being maintained both by the NGO and Gramurja. And there was sort of this tension, push pull kind of tension that was maintained in terms of where you would expect the local committees to actually step up their game and you know take more ownership. And of course, there were cases that were clearly identified and said these need to be resolved uh, because you know they are bottlenecks and the and the plant operator, for example, needs to be trained on how to handle a technical situation. So uh, once the system was live for a significant amount of time there is actually a lot of hand-holding that happens from the uh, service provider and Grambucha and the NGO uh, to resolve obviously any technical issues, any village disputes that occur, uh, but also finding those opportunities to step back and say that you need to really step up and take ownership. So we really found that uh, push and pull kind of very interesting. We did not see situations where the, both these organizations stepped back and said, you know, you have to do it and just be in a watch mode. That actually um, none of those, because we asked villages to highlight the issues they faced from early stages and they cited a number of issues and cited the help they received. Uh, we did not see situations where they did not receive help um, and those that remain remained unresolved. So I think from the perspective of uh, at least in this case, the model was such that there was uh, almost full community ownership that is expected in the long run, because partially they're extremely remote communities. And unless the communities actually take full ownership, it's hard for those to you know, remain operational uh, beyond a certain point. So it is in the interest of the NGO and the solution provider to make sure that uh, the communities are indeed capable of, you know, being on their own to a great extent, barring massive major technical issues for which external intervention is going to be necessary. Um, 
Also, we found that there is ways by which um, all these communities actually uh, meet with the NGO for other reasons, not just energy, because these NGOs are sort of full community development NGOs. Uh, they have ongoing interactions with the communities for other programs that they're running in these places. Uh, so there are regular meetings of these committees um, held uh, often at the NGO site, you know, where these issues can also be raised. So we have saw instances of that happening as well. From the African Development Bank perspective, um, this is a really an interesting question, and it's a question that we've also been debating for the last couple of weeks. Um, in the case of uh, our work in Nigeria, well, introducing this uh, NREL quality assurance framework, if you do want to have uh, a, a mechanism whereby the community or members of the community can file complaints if something is is uh, is not working well, um, but we, the question has been. At our for, between us is who could be the repository of that uh, those complaints, and uh, you know that is is a is is a long term commitment and a commitment that you know how, how do you get paid for? It? So um, I think that the solution that we're exploring is is to put in some kind of uh, complaint mechanism with the regulator in the country. But um, we're still we're still thinking about it and, and discussing it. It's very interesting. Thank you. Um, another question that's come in, which um, uh, is one that chimes a great deal with uh, uh, what the Smart Villages Initiative has been doing. Um, uh, we are uh, are very keen to uh, discuss the fact that the real development impact of uh, energy access initiatives. Uh, should be seen uh, a long time down the road in terms of the the broader impact on the community, whether that's in terms of uh, health or education or uh, uh, electoral engagement or uh, uh, women's empowerment. You know all of those different factors. Um, I notice in the uh, in the system that Ariana and Apana have been discussing, they have a specific um, a specific social engagement, home home well being uh, factor, and uh, and Jeff alluded to some of those. Uh, sorts of measures as well but uh, the question that's come in is 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 how broad do you go uh, where do you stop with some of those development impacts because of course you could you could um, include all uh, 150 different uh, measures under the social uh, sustainable development goals under that so so what do you specifically uh, look at and try to measure when it comes to that wider longer term social impact I you want to? So, Maybe I can yeah, start I on that one. Um, okay, yeah. I'd say for for us, it's it's uh, it's on a country by country basis because those those qualitative uh, impacts have to be basically monitored, evaluated uh, physically, and uh, so you have to have the human resources and 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 the budget to to go out and to do that. And so, for us, that's a, that would be on a on a country by country basis on, on who is actually um, overseeing the the mini grid program for a particular country. In Burkina Faso, for example, um, the the rural electrification agency will have that responsibility and they'll have a budget to do it, and that will allow us to work with them to develop. Um, the survey instruments and the, the other kinds of instruments they they'll they'll apply to collect that data, and that can be pretty robust in that case because they have the resources. Um, there will be other countries that don't have those those dedicated uh, programs and those dedicated resources, so then the, and you probably don't get much you know, in terms of uh, impact information. Uh, Ariana, maybe. Um, yeah, so it's the sort of like social dimension has been one of the hardest to um, to put together into a score, so to say. So in that sort of sense, the limitation of the framework to us allow to assign a score of three to five or one on well-being is particularly difficult because the impact uh, on that area was really coming from 
Um, so there's sort of like a dual uh, push on one side, as you said, just trying to um, categorize this into like education opportunities, health, and time reduction, and so on. But really, I think that the um, most important and valuable uh, outcome from the framework that we've used were coming from really just comments on um, qualitative comments on uh, people improvement on well-being that sometimes could not be categorized into one of these sort of like sustainable development goal like aims on or umbrellas or things of improvements into quality of life overall that was coming from qualitative remarks that was extremely difficult to categorize into one of these scores or frameworks or methodology so that is an extremely hard and difficult measure to refine and develop right and as you said you know these are really on the in the long run they're seen in the long run not necessarily immediately um, where we prioritized some of these measures were really based on what was important for in this case gramuja so what did they intend and what did the communities intend in terms of uh, at least midterm benefits coming from access to electricity? And we focused on those areas to measure, in, in this case, for example, the you know, uh, children actually having now having electricity to study, how does that impact their education? Or if there was solar water pumping that was happening, then how does it actually reduce the number of hospital visits that you know happen because there is better access to water now? Also, does it how does it affect the health of women who were involved in you know fetching better water from long distances otherwise? So we kind of prioritize some of the areas for benchmarking based on the mission that existed of the solution provider and the intent of uh, getting access to electricity in the villages. So that helped a bit, but like we said, you know, these are really in the long run, so it, these are hard <laughs> by definition. Yes, it is a uh, uh, always a, a challenging topic. All right, we have another question here that's come in, which is uh, which is quite a subtle one. Um, so a uh, participant says, is it correct to understand that the Gram Urja study found that user satisfaction did not decrease with technical instability? And if so, can the framework therefore be used to determine reductions in mini grid um, specifications and therefore construction costs um, if those don't are found to not reduce long term satisfaction and payment options? So in other words, um, can the outputs of these um, of these methodologies be used to to optimize future constructions uh, from, from what they find? <laughs> That is indeed a very subtle one for sure. We don't know, <laughs> we don't know which way it will go, but you know, from um, I think um, I want to tie this a little bit to a different study I've done with Gramurja before the MNE, which was to really understand the composition as to why a social enterprise is in this space and why they choose to be in this space. And I think um, one of the findings from that particular study was that. The founders themselves, if you look at, you know, uh, why they're, if somebody, the founders and the employees actually are coming from a background that connects with the communities they're trying to serve in some ways. So, for example, if they have been in tribal communities in the past for some other work, if the employees themselves come from those regions or have an appreciation for those um, I would say that the likelihood of misuse of the information is probably going to go down. But if commercial interests actually take over, uh, maybe yes, because in this case, in this model, there is no ongoing commercial returns uh, from running the mini grids uh, for the social enterprise, at least as of now. If their model changes in future, there might be, I don't know. But for now, they don't have any ongoing revenues and profits coming from operations of these grids. It's all localized for the communities and the villages themselves. So in terms of um, optimizing and you know, sort of uh, not doing the best go forward, it would be in terms of the you know, upfront capital cost and raising, you know, can the cost of the project itself be lowered? That can come in, but... Um, and this is where I think the vision and mindset um, of the 
owners, founders, and the social enterprise probably will play a bigger role and saying, where do they choose to be? And the kinds of opportunities where this organization um, turned away from, as far as funders is concerned, and you know, the discussions and the interviews I've had in the past, um, show that there is a strong linkage as to that less possibility of this happening, but you know, you never know. So I don't know, that's the best answer I can give right now. <laughs> Anybody else feel like weighing in on this uh, on this topic? Well, I'm not. I'm, I think that um, the Graham Urja um, mo business model is very different from the the business model that I see in Africa, where um, um, a lot of the mini grids are built with equity and debt, and um, and and a small amount of grant, but not exclusively grant for CapEx. Um, so um, oversizing, of course, um, sizing the system is, is uh, estimating demand is extremely complicated, but um, um, I think that the developers, when they have their own uh, money in investment, um, they have to also really, really think about and invest in productive use and developing productive use to, uh, to improve the financial performance of their grid. Um, maybe, uh, okay, they, they build a grid and it, uh, there's a lot of capacity that, that goes unused and then the next time they build the grid, they make it smaller. Or, you know, and the other thing is a lot of solar grids can be, uh, um, can be built up uh, progressively. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Good. Okay, we still have a lot of questions um, uh, which haven't been answered yet, but we are uh, running out of our allotted time. So, just at the end, I wanted to give each of our panelists the uh, uh, the chance for a final word, a final sort of reflection on uh, uh, on what they and what their fellow panelists and what the uh, the Q and A session has uh, has brought out of all of this. So, if we maybe go uh, go around the panel again, starting with Ariana for your final thoughts, please. Abana, please go first. I have a think about this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. And I think uh, I really enjoyed the question part of it, of this discussion for sure. Um, the fascinating questions, important questions. And, you know, uh, I think for us, we're really uh, looking at what would this mean if it has to go to other kinds of scenarios, how this would be applied. And some of the questions actually forces us to think that through in, in the discussion part. So I really enjoyed this part. I still see many questions unanswered and hopefully we can get to those answers in time. But also sort of the contrast between the African side, what we saw and what the m and &E that we have done is then sort of uh, interesting. We know that there are sort of commercial, there's a commercial angle to it, but seeing that in the same conversation side by side just heightens or elevates uh, some aspects of the assessment evaluation methods uh, for me. So this was really helpful. Thank you. So um, I can just add something on to what Abarna said and also what the uh, paper that the LCDN had just presented. I think it's it was interesting. I mean, we have looked at one particular full community ownership structure and I think that um, one of the things that has been highlighted to the LCDN paper was the possibility to think about um, other hybrid sort of forms of local governance, so to how to integrate within the, limit, the strengths and limitations of uh, full community ownership, involvement of the communities, empowerment of the communities, uh, but on the other hand, also the limitations in terms of how to um, increase the uh, livelihood engagement of those and this can be maybe an answer that can be sort of uh, brought in if we consider how to mix this with more entrepreneur run type of initiative so this idea of like possibly mixing hybrid type of models to pick the strengths of each uh, and yeah so this is a bit my thoughts and also the differences 
uh, with uh, what uh, sort of like the learning experiences from India and the learning experiences for Africa from Africa that has been brought to the table and yeah thank you very much to uh, you Bernie and all the LCDN network for organizing this Thanks. And Jeff? For me, I can, yeah, I can also just repeat uh, what uh, Aparna and Ariana have said. I, I, I think it's a great opportunity uh, to be on a platform like this and, and, and uh, realize that uh, other people around the world are, are thinking about the same things that you're thinking about when you're sitting all alone in your office. Um, so it, it's, it's valuable to be able to, uh, uh, to be provoked and to, and to be forced to challenge yourself in that way and um, so yeah I found it uh, very uh, very interesting then thank you great and uh, and Ed would you like to have a uh, a final comment from the LCDN our, uh, our partners in organizing this webinar it would help if I turned my mute off wouldn't it it would <laughs> yes we can hear you loud and clear now excellent <laughs> um, yeah, I've, um, I've thoroughly enjoyed the discussion today, and, and I think it, it uh, a couple of things that just occurred to me is, is I think the opportunities for more community-focused systems in in the African as well as the Asian con context is something that is uh, is, is that something that we're we're exploring certainly in the Kenyan context at the uh, at the moment. So I think this idea of of taking the best from from different models and approaches and exploring how they could be operationalized in practice is is a, is a really interesting one. We're actually talking to Gramordia at the moment about about potentially uh, working uh, uh, alongside them in in other in other contexts with, uh, uh, for example, looking at Lesotho as as one possibility in the in the in the near future. So I think this kind of bringing together of people from very different um, contextual backgrounds is a real opportunity to see thinking around mini grids move, moving on and and um, uh, I think in a more innovative direction so we're really quite excited about this and I think also about um, we're hoping to, to still be involved in DFIT's transforming energy access initiative over the course of the coming couple of uh, couple to three to three years and I think there's certainly real opportunities to continue doing this, this kind, these kind of conversations and bringing people together um, and looking for more innovative solutions. And it's something that I think the whole of these webinars have, have been intended to do. So I think today's been a really good uh, example of that, uh, Bernie. Super. Well, uh, it remains for me only to, uh, to thank all of our attendees from all around the world. And our excellent presenters, uh, Ariana Totsi, Dr. Parna Katri, and uh, Jeff Felton. Uh, and to thank you all for joining us and have a good evening, a good afternoon, or a good morning, wherever in the world you happen to be based. As I say, we will be putting the recording of the Which webinar up on our site. And um, after that, uh, you can access that and also copies of presentations by going to our website, e4sv.org. Uh, thank you all very much again. Thank you to our presenters, and we look forward to welcoming you all on our next webinar next month. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Goodbye.